So let me just explain what's going on here. For anybody watching, because I don't mind telling people what an ass I am. <laughs> you and I have been talking now for almost half an hour, and I forgot to hit record. So we just had this amazing conversation and recorded none of it. It was actually the most amazing conversation any two people have ever had. It really so was. There's something kind of epic about that, Chris, that the world will never know. It was, it's a lost recording. But you, so you recorded your half of it, right? So you have your conversation with me, just not my end of it. It's true. So if, if you ever wanted to do something with that, like we have me talking and, and you could hear you, we just wouldn't see you. I knew, I knew it was only a matter of time. When we started doing this, I'm like, you watch. There's going to come an episode where I forget to hit record. I don't even realize it until it's all done. I go to end it, and then I go, I forgot to hit record. We've been talking for an hour. we got to start all over again. So at least it was only half an hour. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. All right, so now that we're warmed up, yeah. welcome back to Doc's House Calls. Today we're talking with Jimmy Collins from Collins Watch Company. So, um... We talked about Spider-Man getting hit by uh, bit by a spider, uh, origin story, grandpa's pocket watch. We're going to do all that again. So, um, <laughs> this is actually kind of good because we'll probably be better at it now. I'll give you like the concise response. All right. So I wanted to talk to you because most of these episodes are with microbrand owners. And whenever I get to talking with microbrand owners, the typical sort of pattern is we end up bitching about all the problems we face. And the difference with you is every time I talk to you, you've got this sort of very upbeat, you know, uh, demeanor, you're always smiling and it seems like you're having a lot of fun. So I just thought it'd be cool to talk to you, especially now since I notice after being a little bit quiet for a while and not kind of being so much on the scene, you're back with a new design. It seems like, you know, you got a Kickstarter project, you're getting, you know, some press. I see you're on the forum. So, I thought now would be a good time to, to connect and sort of find out what you've been up to. So before we get to your current project, let's start out with your background. You're in LA, you work in the music industry, you have a studio, video production, you play an instrument, but you're making watches. So connect the dots. How do you get from I'm Jimmy Collins, the music guy, to I'm Jimmy Collins, the watch guy? Totally. So this is I grew up bit by the radioactive spider. Got your origin story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the origin story. So I'll tell you my origin story. Uh, so basically, I grew up playing music, right? I am a drummer and have always been a music lover and a musician. And then I eventually wind up in LA. And I'm, I'm from New York. I grew up in New York. I wound up moving to LA in my like early 20s. And I connected with a buddy of mine. We decided to build a studio. And we built this really cool boutique recording studio in Hollywood with lots of interesting analog audio recording equipment, and, it, and it's very custom. So that process of designing a recording studio for me was my first time designing something physical. I had done a lot of graphic design in the past, and I, I've made a ton of videos with my other company on a video production company. So, so I've, I've always been in the visual space. Uh, in my professional career, but that was like, wow, we've designed a physical space. And doing a lot of that custom stuff and looking at some of these really beautiful bits of analog recording equipment, I was like, this, this is a very cool aesthetic. I like it and I want to do something with this and I want to do something that I could sell as a product. And combine that with my passion for watches. I've always loved watches. I've been, I, I would say, a watch guy for you know, most of my life. Um, I, I just decided, let's, let, let me try it. So I sketched something out on Illustrator and started just making a, what I considered to be a watch and then went down the rabbit hole. You, you know what that rabbit hole is like. I mean, actually going from a little drawing to a physical watch that one can wear on the wrist is a hell of a process. So that was, right. uh, that was an interesting thing. So here's a curveball we didn't get to before. So in the process of designing your first watch, were there sort of, you know, design dead ends that you went down, sort of one-way streets that didn't lead anywhere? Or, you know, was there sort of aborted attempts? Like, how many iterations did you go through before you had the one that you wanted to make? Oh, I mean, I think that the design, the actual visual design happened very quickly. I think that was like a few hours 
of just tinkering on Illustrator and I came up with something I like. And honestly, that original file is largely what the watch is now in terms of the dial. The rest of the watch was absurd because I, not knowing anything about watchmaking, would demand things or ask for things that I would get laughed at, right? So, so I'd give work- me an example. Okay, so one example I had was like, well, I rarely use the date feature, right? So I want to do something different with the date. What if it could be a counter? You know, what if you could just click a button and the date would advance like a counter? You know, like I'm out at the bar at the guys, I want to keep track of how many drinks I've had. Something like that. I was like, that's actually a that's a useful complication as opposed to like moon phase, which I just don't need. But how many drinks have I had? Exactly. On watch? Oh, that would that's actually a complication. be pretty useful. I, I probably shouldn't have said this because I, I I should be the first one to do. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I think things like that are are really interesting, and that's how I approached this was just be creative with it, not knowing anything about how hard it is to modify a movement or do something weird that people don't do. You know, I, one thing I was like, you know, I like the Timex Indiglo thing. How do we do that? And I think that's kind of cool how you push it and the whole thing glows. That's just better. Warm on and demand. Why not? Yeah. And then you get into like what it would actually take to do something like, like that. And then you also, at that point, like I'm a novice. I, I didn't know that much about loom and how much guys freak out over loom and different types of loom and they really want c3 and if i did something timex like it would be like oh you know that's right timex like or something so you know there were a lot of things like that that i had to compromise on and figure out and and then and then cost is a huge thing right there are a lot of times where i'd speak to my watchmaker and he'd be like yeah you could do that just bear in mind we'd have to hire an engineer it yeah. would take months $50,000 just design that one custom part. So a lot of it is, it's like a puzzle, right? And you start figuring out what you can do within the constraints you have, which is awful at times, but it can also be really fun. Yeah. One of my designers and I, so I, I've got two designers. Aaron is like our 2D graphic designer and Rusty is our 3D guy. And he's like really good with the 3D modeling. And uh, Rusty and I have been working together longer than, than Aaron's been on the team. So one of the things that Rusty and I worked on years ago was we started to think about this concept of taking the hands off the watch and mounting, you know, sort of gears on the hands post and having the gears all kind of work off each other above the dial and having, you know, sort of like numbered discs through the time, almost like the Seiko discus burger. But yeah. You know, we had a different kind of spin on it. It would look kind of different. It would all sort of be like, almost like a skeleton watch, but it would be very sort of cool how the, how the time would come together and be displayed. And then we started, you know, sort of building it in 3D and looking at, you know, how it might work. And then we got stuck. We were like, you know, we don't know enough about the physics of how much torque or energy can be generated by the movement through that hands post for all we know, this thing won't even work. Like all these gears are just going to seize up because there's not enough, you know, force getting coming off that hand, that central hand post. Like you don't know what you don't know. And we were like, I don't even know what this would cost to produce. I don't even know how to explain this to a factory in China. Like you just kind of go like, you know, we're just going to make a stupid three-hander, you know, with a date, not a bar, not a drink counter, you know. <laughs> I tell you, I I want to I want to own the drink counter watch. That's going to be. <laughs> When you come up with that, that is going to be game changer. Huge. Big yeah. league. Big league. Right, so, <laughs> so you told me, I'm not even going to ask you the question. I'm just going to give people the answer. You told me when we weren't recording that you started this almost exactly two years ago, somewhere we either just passed or are coming up on your two-year anniversary. So you did the Bronson, hit it off on Kickstarter, largely because you were ended up getting really good organic coverage from a blog to watch and you got covered in morning wound and the way you did that was by basically sending out a blast email to the press so let, let's pause there tell us about that what was in that email that you got, you think got people to notice it as opposed to hi i'm jimmy you don't know me i'm making a watch we can talk about it yeah i don't know i i think so i look at what do i respond to when people reach out to me right when you start a kickstarter you get a ton of messages from various marketing agencies. 
And when someone says something like, hello, we saw your project on Kickstarter and we like what you're doing. We would like to work with you. It's like my project. You couldn't even take the time to write your watch, your project for Hyperion. There, there are things like that, that I know that when I receive a marketing email from somebody, if it's not personalized, if it's not customized, if it doesn't show that they took the time to actually look yeah. at wh who they're talking to, I'm like, forget it. Google watch company owner? Like, yeah, exactly. But so, so I wrote well-written, you know, perfect grammar, punctuation emails that were very much customized. Hi, Zach. How are you? Zach from Warren Wild. Whatever it was. And I, I think people responded to that. We also didn't hear back from a lot of people. And some of it at, in the first iteration with the Bronson, some of it was organic and some of it was paid, right? Like the, the, our first a blog to watch post was a sponsored post. It says sponsored post on it and everything. Our right. first Warner One article was unpaid. That was just, I got lucky. And I think there was some of that that people thought it was cool. And they said, hey, we'll write about it. And then some people were like, yeah, this is cool. We'd love to have it here. But this is a Kickstarter project, so this would be more of a sponsored post for us. But so then that, that starts the relation. That's stuff about personalizing the email. I kind of look at that as sort of like that's table stakes. Like that just gets you in the game. That doesn't mm -hmm. help you win. I think you had other stuff in those emails. You know, the, the sort of, you, you were starting to craft a story for them, the reader, to, to get interested in. As opposed to, dear Zach, I'm Jimmy from Collins Watch Company. Can I show you my watch? Will you please talk about it? So there's something in there that they get those emails all the time. I know because I've sent them, you know, mm -hmm. like, hi, me again. I'm making another watch. Can we get it in, in Warning Wound this, this time or a blog to watch this mm -hmm. time? How did you differentiate from the other three dozen guys emailing them that day? Well, I, okay, so I'd say it's three things. I'd say it's one, the design of your watch. You know, some, so they, they have to, you could have the best story in the world, the best this and the best that. If somebody looks at it and goes, ugh, or I, it's not for me, they're probably not going to write about it. So I think that A, there had to be that. You have to include a photo of some sort or at least a link that someone can look at what it is. B, it's you, right? So it's who is this guy emailing me? Have they taken the time to address me appropriately? Um, you know, this is from the recipients. And are they, is, there, is this someone who I think is likable, who I like? And then C, it's the story behind the watch itself. And I, I think that that was probably the hook more than anything else that got us some coverage on the first watch was that it's a watch that has a design inspired by the world of audio recording, which to my knowledge hasn't been done or hadn't been done. It was kind of a unique spin. It's not like super on the nose. It's not like there's just, you know, recording instrumentation everywhere, but it's like the crown, if you can see it, is shaped like a volume knob. Yeah. Little, little things like that, you little know. Touches. Yeah, yeah, like brew, brew, you know, brew watches, they do that. Like there's a, there's a bit that shows the amount of time to pull a shot of espresso. Right. Like little features like that that you're not going to notice right off the bat, but which you kind of appreciate. And it kind yeah. of gives you a story behind your watch. And as I become more and more entrenched in this world, and I love the world, when you have conversations about watches, they it's the story watches that tell something it's like the guy wearing the snoopy speedy or the tin tin it, it, it's one of these watches that it's like well let's talk about it this is why this, this isn't just your regular speedy this is a real interesting reference number um that kind of stuff is super cool and so to build a watch that has a story right there on it i think is cool and I also press worthy i, I agree I, with I, you and that's where i was trying to get to is i think too many guys in this business focus on the product, the product, the product, and they sort of neglect the story of the brand and the story of the product. And we forget that these are, yeah, you know, we talk about specs and value, but really what attracts us is the good design. And what draws us in past the design is the story and feeling like there's a connection or something we can kind of, you know, hook into. And I think that, you know, too many guys just kind of go like design by checklist. It's got, you know, this movement, this sapphire crystal, this water resistance, stainless steel case, bracelet, clasp, expansion, this. Here you go, 400 bucks. And it's like, tell me, like, how is it different than every other guy doing that same thing? It is so hard, as you know, Chris, to distinguish yourself based on features. You know, it, it's like. Everybody could do features. I could do features all day long. Table. 
right? There right. are certain, somebody's looking for a Swiss automatic. Somebody's looking for this. Okay, there are certain features that will put you in a room of people, right? That then they'll go, okay, well, I'll look at this. But you need a hook. You need something that's going to kind of set you out from the crowd. Right. Um, you know, of course, yeah. If, if you're a micro brand doing a tourbillon minute repeater with a drink counter complication, that's weird. You can distinguish yourself by features. But I don't think that – I don't have the ability to do that right now. I'd love to get to that point where I can create right. watches with just bizarre, interesting features. And I keep a list. I have a whole list of, like, bizarre watches I would love to do but cannot even come close to affording right now. So for now, at the very least, I've got to really – it forces you to up your design game and to really work on your marketing and your story. And I've got a lot to learn. I, you know, I've got a ways to go, but it's fun. Well, that's actually, so that's an interesting kind of addition to this whole topic, which, you know, any, everybody in the business is sort of trying to out feature the next guy. And that's sort of a road to nowhere or downward spiral because we're all sort of in competition against each other. And there's always somebody who's going to be willing to sell the same specs, same components for less. What you're looking at though, or talking about is interesting in that, at a certain point, if you add stuff that not everybody else is doing, other features like turbions or whatever, okay, fine, you can sell that feature. But especially in this price range where you're a micro brand, you're not really, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not going out and doing in-house. You're not, you're not creating anything new from an, from an orological perspective. So, if you're strictly relying on features and price, it's a really competitive market. The, the, the competition is super thick. So it does really matter how much you think about design, but also how much you think about branding and marketing and you know, engagement online. And so having that early, you know, that sort of early uptake from a worn and wound or a blog to watch, you know, Gear Patrol, whoever, when you're launching your Kickstarter project can really be the difference between success and failure for a lot of startups. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I think that's the only way to do it starting off. Unless you have a gazillion dollars and you can custom design interesting movements and features you, you re, or, or use bizarre materials. That's another thing you can do. And that's what I'm finding now. Not that it's that bizarre and not that it hasn't been done, but I launched a meteorite watch last weekend and it's been really popular. It, yeah. People are really interested in it. And I think that that is a material that has a story. So I've learned not just, okay, cool, it's a meteorite, it has, you know, a different pattern, the, the Vindenstaten, whatever, whatever the name of the meteorite pattern is. Um, but I learned about my specific meteorite we used. And it's a meteorite that landed in present day Sweden over a million years ago. And every single slice of it is slightly different. And that's cool, right? right. And I think every watch is a one of a kind. Yeah, and that's now the watch that I'm wearing around. And when I talk to people about it, everyone, especially non-watch guys who don't know that meteorite is like a thing in the watch world, they go, whoa, that's so cool. And I've already gotten a few people just buy it who are, are buddies of mine because they're like, oh, that's amazing. Put a million-year-old space rock on your wrist, and that's part of the storytelling, right? And, and it's also just cool. At the end of the day, like, it's got to be – cool. It's got to be something that you can look at and be like, wow, I, I like the way that looks. And then if you could build a story on top of that and brand it well, um, you know, you've got, I think, a winning comp, uh, combination. Let's hope so. So you did the Bronson three-hander with a Seiko and H35, and then you come out with the Bronson chronograph as a quartz chronograph with an ISO Swiss movement. Yep. This is now what, your third model, the, the, the new one, the Hyperion? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is the this is the third model. We did four variants of it, um, and it uses a SW two hundred. So we went Swiss. It's a Salita movement. We let me see. It it has. Uh, we did like a custom rotor plate on yeah, it. It's cool. To kind of to, to at least justify the uh, the sapphire back. We did. Um, it's double dome sapphire. Uh, we went with a brushed finish. It's the same case though. So it's the right. same case as the Bronson. We just added enough polish and refinement to it. It's a very different, I wouldn't say very different, but it's a, a more simplified kind of refined dial. So, so that's what I wanted to ask you about it. So, you know, people ask me, how do I get into this? So, you know, we have a model called the NTH subs. 
Yeah, of there's course. 30, I know that. There, there's, there, there's over 30 different versions. So yeah. is that 30 versions of one model or is each one a different model? And so I was going to ask you, like, do you look at the Hyperion as being sort of the, the Bronson 2.0? Or do you look at them as being kind of distinct? Because I do notice that they have a similar design language. So in your, in your mind as the brand owner and designer, is it, no, that, no, it's totally different? Or yeah, it kind of is sort of an evolution. It's sort of a, the next edition of what we've already did. We just gave it a new name. Yeah, it's a good question. I do see it as a different watch because it, it is different enough to me and the design process and everything that I put into it, there's enough distinguishing the two watches but yes, there, I'm absolutely, you look at the two watches, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, it's the same case, it's the same handset, it's the same size, there's a lot of similarities. So I do see it almost as, it's a new watch, but it's like an evolution of the last watch. It's almost like, a, you know, like the difference between a BMW 3 Series and a 5 Series, you know, where it's like a similar looking car, but there are just enough differences where it's a different car. Although I guess one of those is bigger, but you get what I'm trying to say. I look at it as a different watch, but I fully recognize it, it, it has a lot of similarities to the first watch. The, so the new thing I'm working on now is totally different. Well, that's all right. So let's go, let's fast forward. So the Bronson was heavily inspired, uh, influenced by your um, experience building a studio and your appreciation for that aesthetic of the studio equipment. A lot of it was vintage. And that, of course, carried over immediately directly almost unchanged into the Bronson chronograph now you're doing the Hyperion is it thematically sort of still influenced by the same stuff that the Bronson was influ influenced by or is it something where no it's got its own story it's different somehow like you know again like what do you think about it yeah I would say that it is similar in that it has that that crown it still has the volume knob crown so 100% like the brand ethos or whatever you want to call it is inspired by music, inspired by audio recording and that world and that type of equipment. But this one is, I would say, less directly, this one is almost more based on the old watch than it is based on recording equipment, if that makes sense. So where do you go from here? Is it going to be everything that Collins does will have something rooted in music? Or, because you just said, you just got done saying the next thing is going to be completely different. You don't have to give us, you don't have to give us too much of a clue, but do you, where do you see yourself going with this? Are you going to keep going to the same well, or are you going to explore other territory? What, what are you going to do? Yeah, well, I'm happy to tell you about the next thing. So I'm, I've designed a dive watch, and I'm really excited about it. I, I love it. But, but that is an interesting question, right? No, seriously, you would be excited about whatever you're doing. I would, <laughs> I would I'd be like, yeah, I'm excited about it too. Jimmy's excited. I'm excited. We're all excited. So Chris, guess what? After this conversation, I'm going to go get lunch. How amazing is that? I might even have a coffee. I'm going to get a panini. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, good. All right. So, so you're making a diving watch. Tell us about it. Yeah. So, okay. So then how do you take a dive watch and tie that into the world of audio engineering? They're, they're, you know, you don't mix water with studios, right? So I was thinking, sound okay. sound does travel more underwater, right? Right. So the watch is called the sonar. So... Basically, I'm, I'm taking elements of sound and a different type of audio engineering and putting some of that design language. Like I've actually been looking at sonar readers and vintage sonars, and it's actually very similar to audio recording equipment. And it is using sound. It's recording sounds and visualizing sounds to be able to tell where things are in the water. So I'm trying to be clever with it to not be so on the nose and say like, yeah, we've built an underwater audio recording equipment inspired watch because that doesn't make sense. But if you call it sonar, it makes sense. And, right. and people I think get that. And, and I love the look of it. And I think that makes it a little different because especially when you go into the dive watch world, it is, as you know, hard to distinguish yourself because like that, that's like, now I feel like I've been playing somewhat in the minor leagues with the type of watches I've been doing, but now it's like, I feel like I'm trying to compete in the big leagues, trying to do a diver. Um, and yeah. honestly, I've been inspired by a lot of watches. I've, uh, how can you not be inspired by the Submariner? But also I'm a big Doxa fan. So I've been looking at a lot of Doxas right. and in terms of colors, right? Like the, the, the yellow vintage diving star is a really cool color. And I, you don't see that, right? You see like 
more of a banana yellow or you see different yellows. So I'm like, what if we can get real close to that? And, and even the new doc says they did a different yellow. So but I'm thinking, along. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm thinking of things like that. How do I take like little design cues from a bunch of different dive watches, throw it together into something that will look like a dive watch and people say, yeah, that's a diver but not say that is just like blah and you've fully copied that. Or but just also, another generic diver that's built on specs, you know, for the price, whatever. Yeah. yeah, but then also tie it in with my brand and have it make sense because it's a little weird if you're like, yeah, here's this watch and then you throw something out there that's like completely different. Right. Um, now, that said, it's like, yeah, you've got to keep differentiating. you got to do something. I remember when you came out with the Devil Ray. Yeah. That was a really cool watch. I remember seeing that when you first had it and I was like, whoa, that's, that's unique. That's different. Right. And so you, yeah. I feel like there's a certain evolution, but, but it still fit with your brand. And I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, you know, NTH, it's, you know, all vintage inspiration. Um, and we kind of wanted to do something, you know, similarly, you know, with a bit of Doxa inspiration in it. Um, we were looking at, you know, sort of vintage Certina DS2, DS3, um, but I was also, I've always kind of really been heavily influenced by um, Japanese design. I'm real, I really admire Seiko cases and I wanted to do something like Grand Seiko-ish in the shape mm -hmm. of the case, um, you know, a little bit of Orient Psalms in there, but, um, you know, and also, you know, like, I, I, I also like the 70s. So um, the Omega Dynamics were, were supposed to be like the most ergonomically well-designed watch of the time. And I wanted to do something that was sort of, you know, gave more thought to the ergonomics of how it fit the wrist. Um, so Hyperion's on Kickstarter right now and you're at 50,000, the goal was 40. So you blew past the goal and you still have how much time left? A little over two weeks. Okay. And do you have a production number set or are you gonna decide that when you're done with the Kickstarter project? I already produced them. So I did, I already produced my first run. I mean, in truth, I wanted to launch the Kickstarter back in November. Uh, I just got our prototypes back and I wasn't, there were, there were enough things wrong with them that I was like, I, I can't release this and say that this is the watch. Right. Um, I've been there. Yeah. I mean, let me show you. I have it right here. Like the hand set here. This was one of the, uh, the prototypes. The hands just, just, they were too big. I don't know if it, you can tell from yeah. there, but there are a few things that seconds hand is too long and it's just, there were just enough things off with it that I was like, I, I can't have this be the watch. I, I need to fix a few things. Um, so I just said, screw it. And we went into production. Um, you know, I made a few hundred watches. And so most of the Kickstarter backers are going to get their watch right after the campaign. But for so sure. Walk me through that. Cause I, I'm, I think I saw somebody on Facebook kind of going like, how dare he start a Kickstarter project when he's already made the watch. And I'm like, it's I, great. Is there a rule book somewhere that says you can't do that? Like, I, I guess people have this mindset where Kickstarters for people that need the money. And if they don't get the money, the watch won't get made. And if you've got the money to make the watch, what are you doing on Kickstarter? That's not what I'm saying. I just, that's the vibe I'm getting from people online. It's kind of like you're dishonest somehow if you go and make the watch and then you go on Kickstarter, but you wouldn't right. be the first guy to do that. So have you gotten pushback? Have you, have you had to deal with that at all? Barely. And, and that's one thing I, especially in this world and anything online, you could do anything and somebody is going to complain about it. Don't so I don't sense. care about that. that you, you, people can grumble all they want. The fact of the matter is I, the watches may have been manufactured, but I still have a ways to go before I can deliver them. You know, I, I've got to put all the straps on the watches. I've got to print up my warranty cards. I've got to do everything. So it really still is a pre-sale, right? Like these are not all fully ready to go. Right. A, B, by doing a Kickstarter, you can, pre-sell watches that haven't been made yet. So case in point, this watch, I only have 20 of them to sell. To sell, I've already sold about 30 of them, right? So, and those very clear, those awards clearly say September delivery. So in essence, I'm selling my inventory that I have now and then pre-selling more beyond that. And then also giving myself an opportunity to create a campaign. And I think there's something really fun about doing something that's like, okay, we've got X number of days, it's a finite campaign. We're putting it all out there. 
And yeah, I mean, I, I don't get why someone would. It's not claim. fun, Jimmy. It's a pain in the ass to do a Kickstarter project. That's why I'm not doing them anymore. And the oh, fact that you're awful. enjoying yourself really rubs me the wrong way. It's awful. But the thing is, I'm also like, I've already done a lot of the, the hard, uh, you know, work doing the photos and shooting the video and doing the graphic design. So now I'm a little more in the phase where I can like, you're like perpetually, you're, you're incorrigibly upbeat because I got so sick and tired of Kickstarter projects and sort of the rigidity of the process and like sort of the constraints they put you under and like, you know, the demands from the backers and the communicate. I, I was like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. And you're like, Oh, this is great. I'm having a good time. It's so much fun. I'm like, I, it's making me hate you a little bit. <laughs> no, no. Well, if you had, if you had seen me three weeks ago on my like 10th all nighter, you know, as I'm like kind of peeling myself from one part of my studio to another, I, I think you'd, you'd think very differently, but I do, I, this is probably my last Kickstarter. I think that from here, I'll just do like pre-sales on my website I'm even thinking of doing a pre-sale based on renders mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, offering that at one price and having that be like a month off the render, then pre-sale based off of prototypes and then sale. I've done that. Yeah, yeah, you would be the first guy to do that. We used to do that and we would do like, all right, well, we're going to start pre-orders now. We ordered prototypes already. They'll be here in four months. And then if they're good, we'll go to production. That'll be another four months. So we'll gradually start ratcheting up getting closer to the final retail price. So if you want to get in right now based on a 2D render, that's all we got, great. You get the lowest price. You want to get in two days before we're ready to deliver, full price. And I think that, I think that makes sense once people start to think about it in that way. Like I'm getting a bigger discount because I'm getting in earlier, more risk. I have to be more willing to deal, you know, deal with delays and changes that may come about through prototyping than somebody that you know goes, oh, he's ready to deliver next week, I'll buy it. You know, I'm gonna get a 20%. No, no 20% at that point. Um, you also want a sunglasses or a glasses company. Did, yeah. did that start before the watches or after the watches? Are you like, I need to make money because the watches aren't making money? How did that get started? Yeah, that was first. So I mean, like these are my glasses, I design them. Um, I spoke your glasses in DC last year and I, I forgot, I wanted to come by and show my wife, I'm like, check these out. And then like at the end of the day, I'm like, just get me out of here. I want to go home. I forgot all about coming by, but I, they're great glasses. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of them. They're handmade in California. They're really nice, like acetate. This is Maskelly, which is like that's like the that's like the uh, the Etta of of uh, of acetate. You know, they're a, a well established, nice Italian acetate brand. So they're they're good, nice glasses. Um, I love them. I did a Kickstarter. It was my first first Kickstarter. Uh, which launched back in, I think that was December of 2016. So it was a little before the watch and it was great. I just found that it, I, I'm more focused on watches right now because watches, it has a world. It has a customer that you can fairly easily define. There's a, a plugged in understandable way to market it. Uh, I love the design process of a watch. You know, it, it was a little harder to design these because it's a little more fluid and a watch you, it's a little more scientific in terms of like, okay, we're going to do a 40 millimeter case, you know, it'd be 13 millimeter thickness, the lug Very to lug, 48 millimeter. Somebody can read that online and go, yeah, that's going to fit on my wrist. Whereas with glasses, when you're selling them online, somebody goes, oh, that looks really cool. They buy it from you and they go, oh, it didn't fit my face. And so it just gets a little tricky with that. So it's a harder business. So I'm not saying that I've given up. I'm still selling sunglasses on my website and I love them. And I will probably do more of that going forward, but it's not something that I'm focused on right now as much as I am on my, the watch side of the business. All right, so we'll go back to watches. We'll just wrap this up with the glasses. So I was looking for your glasses website and, and I couldn't find one. I just found them as an accessories part of your watch website. So is that the only place we can find your glasses? Right now, yeah. So that's what I switched it to. So it used to be more like, here's a glasses website that has watches on it. And then I, and I, and I went, oh no, that's, that's not what we are now. We're a watch company that also has a whole line of sunglasses that are really cool. So you know who else does that is Autodromo. Like you go on their website and it's a watch company but they sell accessories and their sunglasses are on there. So that yeah, is like actually- Boulder has like, well Stratton, Stratton had like, um, Kyle actually had a really nice leather satchel with, um, he's really into racing. So he had the, um, 
Martini racing colors. He actually licensed them from Martini racing and he had the straps of the leather bag done with that Martini racing stripe, that blue on blue with a touch of red Martini racing stripe, gorgeous bag. So he did well with those. I know Justin Edorovich from Blacklist has like, um, you know, like the typical like watch carrier, which a lot of watch companies sell, but Boulder does like, they have like a passport wallet and like a satchel and like, I don't know, some other stuff. Um, I'm waiting for somebody to come out with like a folding blade, like a knife, um, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, the gun accessories, whatever. I mean, somebody's going to do it eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy just doing only the watches. I got enough on my plate right there. Um, so Bronson sold out. Do you still have some? I have a couple left. So actually we just did our, our, a new production order. So we have new Bronsons in that are going to be announced officially in about like a week or two. The three-hander so or the chronograph? The three-hander. Okay. So the chronograph I'm, I'm pretty much sold out of and then I'm gonna phase that out for now because I wanna eventually make that automatic. I like the idea of just being automatic throughout the whole line. All of our watches are automatic. I think it's just easier to present it that way. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's what I think. I just think that's a little cooler. So that's where I'm headed. So I'm gonna discontinue the, the chronograph as it is here, but do a very similar design and re-release it hopefully a year or two down the road with an auto movement. All right, so where do you spend most of your time in a given day? Is it Collins Watch Company, running a music studio? Or, you know, like, are you just kind of like, I got staff for all that. I'm sitting on the beach, you know, drinking a Mai Tai. What's your daily day like? Are you, I mean, are you just watches, 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 and the music studio is making noise in the background? What's it like there? Well, I, it's funny because my, my other career, my, my video production company, right, which has been my, my income source for many years, is it's a very cyclical business, right? Like I'll get out, I, I shoot a lot of TV commercials. I direct a ton of TV commercials, but those are very finite time period kind of things. So I might be on the road for two weeks working around the clock, pulling crazy hours, fly, practically live in an airplane, and we're just doing that. But then we finish the project and I might have two weeks. So basically, I if I'm not shooting videos, I'm working on watches. Or I'm on vacation with my girlfriend. But that's, you know, that that's that's becoming rarer. Although we have to go to Italy next week for a wedding, which is kind of exciting. Wow. Uh, and a little I love stupid this whole thing of destination out. weddings. It's like, oh no, you don't have to get us a gift. We're gonna get married in Italy. You have to spend four thousand dollars to get like I, I just got my flights yesterday. Yeah, they were uh, not cheap, but uh, and I and I stupidly planned great friend. Great, great, yeah, good wedding. job, Karen. Nice job, Karen. Four thousand dollars to get to your wedding. No thanks. <laughs> yeah, Karen and Kevin, they had to do it. But uh, we are. Uh, but it, it'll be fun. Like once you're there, it's a blast. It'll be fun. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to be managing my Kickstarter while I'm there, which is really good planning on my part. I'm going to England next month. And I know that that's going to be like the week that I'm gone, something big is going to be happening and I'll need to be here and I just can't be here. And I'm like, all right, I got my computer, but you know, like, what are you going to do? So is this your first time going to Italy? No, no, I've been, I've been in Italy before. I, I actually got to work on a film there, which is kind of cool. Wow. I was the behind the scenes guy uh, making a documentary for this feature film that they were shooting in Italy. And we were, we were largely shooting in Venice. So that, that was a crazy experience where I'm like flying out to Venice, but not to be a tourist. And we're like on these utility boats, like on a normal set, you've got a camera truck. We had a camera boat. Right. So you'd ride to Go work Venice. at three in the morning to catch the sunrise on the camera boat, you know, through the canal. So, so that was my first experience. I'd been to Italy once before. That was my first real experience, like being in Italy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, we're going to be in Siena, which is really beautiful. We, we were there in Lake Como region, North Italy, like 12 sure. years ago. Yeah, but our big family trip, my parents kind of took the whole family. They got like a villa on Lake Como. Nice. It, yeah, it was like two miles up the road. That was where they caught Mussolini. Um, that was like the big, like, oh, really? Mussolini? We got to go find out where they, where they hung him. Um, but our kids were like toddlers. So it was just, you know, like... Uh, every day like you know lugging those kids up the mountainside you know it's, it's the italian alps but uh you know yeah beautiful area we want to get back there now that our kids are older we'll leave them at home um so the music studio you talked about video production running your watch company 
is the music studio like handled by your partner or is that just something that kind of runs itself or it's like people come in, they, you, you give them the key, they record and they leave, they lock up and they're gone? Yeah, that largely runs itself. So, so essentially I've, I've kind of phased out of that from like an operational role and I've just, you know, it's there. I'm really proud of it. We built this beautiful studio. I can go there whenever I want, but I'm sort of, I'm not doing that anymore. My role is largely putting it there, designing it, getting it started. Well, somebody it comes off. to the studio, they don't get to meet Jimmy. No, thank good for them. We were in Nashville last year and we went to the, um, I forget the name of the studio, but it was Jack White studio from the White Stripes. Cool. My sons were like disappointed they didn't get to meet Jack White. I'm like, it's his studio. It doesn't mean he's going to be here. Like you don't get to yeah. just go like walk in yeah. and meet Jack White. It's Jack White studio. <laughs> yeah. And it is, it's, it's a funny, a studio is a really interesting place because it is this weird creative environment. I've, I mean, and it's totally dark. There's no windows. So you could just wind up. I, I, when we first launched the studio, it was kind of cool because we would just have these epic jam sessions. We'd be in there till seven in the morning. You know, you'd walk out. That was in my, my rock and roll phase of life. But some of the characters that would come in, you know, Jimmy, it's Jimmy, like. Back up from the camera for a second. Let us see your hair. It's, uh, yeah. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me explain something to you. When that's your haircut, you're not out of the rock and roll you know, lifestyle <laughs> yet. You got Lyle Lovett on your, I mean, that, that's why uh, Lyle Lovett. You're still in the rock and roll lifestyle. Don't piss up my leg and tell me it's raining. This is more like I've, I've been doing a watch launch and I haven't gotten my hair cut in a while, but I'll take it. It looks but like I'm you're not, doing like, oh my God, things are going like so, you know, not well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a little, ah. But, but, uh, but the studio, so we would just have these epic jam sessions. Then we're in the middle of Hollywood and it's a nice studio. So sometimes somebody would find out. So you, you, the, you wouldn't believe some of the people that I, I was like that house drummer. So I'd just be there drumming all night. And then I'm looking, I'm like, that's Sean White playing guitar. You know, the famous snowboarder. He's just, yeah. you know, playing guitar. Yeah, and, you're, and then someone else is playing bass. And you're like, that was the guy from Weezer. And you're having all these crazy experiences. And you're like, I don't know how these people got here. I don't know what's going on. You know, I've had a few PBRs and I'm just sitting here just rocking on the drums. And that, those are those are good times. I don't have those times anymore. Not now. For some reason, I am largely by myself. You know, fiddling around with watches and dealing with uh, you know. Yeah, nobody nobody cool online. stops by when you're working it. Like nobody's nobody's ever come by here. I'm like, oh, check it out. Look who it is. It's yeah. You know, no. Yeah. Have you ever been starstruck? Like, has somebody come by and you're like, oh my god, I can't believe he's in the same room with me. Uh, I mean. It probably, but but living in Hollywood for long enough, you kind of, it's funny because when you see someone famous in Hollywood, it's it's cool, but it's not like everyone plays it cool. You know, right. you're at the coffee shop and it's like, oh, that's Natalie Portman. And you're like, that's pretty cool. But you're just sort of like doing your thing. It's not like other parts of the world where it's like, what? That's a celebrity. It's yeah. Like, I always have this, like, this thing where I'm like, imagine getting into the elevator and you're standing there and Bill Murray's next to you. Like, I would follow him out of the elevator just to hang out. Like, I'd be walking down the hotel corridor, going to his room, like, Mr. Murray, one more question. Like, just, come on, do the Caddyshack voice for me. Like, there's no yeah. way. If I meet Bill Murray, I'm not leaving him alone. And, and he has, there are great stories about alone. him. I What's bet, I, like, there are amazing stories where he'll just crash a party. You well, know, that's like, why I want to meet Bill Murray, because I've heard, like, the stories about him where he's, like, a normal, like, chill dude, where he'll, like, yeah, I'll bring you the drink. Like, Tom Hanks is like that, too. Like, Tom Hanks is the photo bomber ninja. Yep. Like there are certain guys like I just want to like I don't want to die before I meet Tom Hart, you know, Tom Hanks or Bill Murray. But if I did, I know like I would just be like, oh my God, it's so cool to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've, I've had a few people that you meet and you're like, wow, that's awesome. And even if somebody who's not famous to most people, but somebody who, who you look up to, you're like, right. I, I once met Chris Vale at a watch show. And yeah. I was like, don't, don't, man, don't, the legend. Don't do <sighs> you had me with PBR. <laughs> um yeah so all right so who's like the biggest celebrity you've ever met and, and then we'll get off this topic oh i hate this one because I, I hate the name dropping I what well, name nobody's dropping. none of them are going to watch this i mean are you so for, let me, I'll, I'll change it are any of the celebrities you've met watch geeks like I, like john mayer is supposedly like a big watch geek i don't know if you've met him but have you met anybody they're like oh yeah like i'm in the watches come by the house i'll show you the collection anything like that not not quite like that but i did i did get to know ashton kutcher which is oh, really yeah. cool and i remember he had some really wild watches and I, i'll never forget my buddy of mine was borrowing one of his watches and 
it was just, it was more of a jewelry watch and it just had diamonds everywhere. And I remember seeing that and just being like, like Kanye. yeah. And I was like, that's crazy that he's just letting you borrow this. Like that, that blew my mind. Like, you know, Did that's you ever a- get into it. Like you just, you know, normal conversation. You're Jimmy, the music guy. You're talking with another music guy, somebody famous and they find out you have your own watch company. Do they ever go like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I've definitely talked to friends of mine. Uh, a buddy of mine is uh, Eric is in a band called Midlake. They're one of my favorite bands. That I, I would say probably more of an indie band. It's not like a like everyone has heard of Midlake, but I love them. I'm obsessed with them. And yeah, we talked about watches and had a great time about it. So I, th- I think that's a cool thing about watches is that there are so many different people and so many different types of people that admire watches and on different levels too, right? right? Like we're, we're more in the, like we've gone full watch geek, right? Like never go full I, watch geek. What's that? Never go full watch geek. Well, yeah. I'm, I, I, I feel like I have, and yeah, I'm unfortunately, doing, doing you know, like, from honestly, like, I like that. This is where I'm at in my life. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk about the celebrities. I want to talk to you about date windows, Chris. Like, what do you think? I'm doing a new watch. Do I need a date? And I, I don't like, it. you know, that, that's where I'm at. You know, I've, I've yeah. kind of no, gone I've, just full door. You know, so two quick sort of parallel stories. So um, John Keel, who basically runs this channel, watch with us. He's super into country music and he's gotten to know like guys that are sort of like, you know, I guess they're famous in country. I don't, I don't listen to country, so I don't know like anybody famous in country. But apparently, like, there's a guy he knows who's like a guitarist for some country band. It's kind of big, and that guy's like trying to start a watch company. He's got like his own design. He wants to start a company, and I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Like, what's the hook? Um, and one of my customers posted a screenshot. Like, basically, he took a he took a picture of his television screen. He was watching uh, Guy Fieri's grocery games and one of the guys on that show was wearing one of my watches and oh, I was like, oh that's awesome my watch is on tv <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> that's awesome yeah i mean that was as close as i ever got to fame um yeah so anyway like i, I promised we changed topics now we are um so you talked about your dive watch you're in the hyperion you know what what's down the road like do you have big dreams of like, you know, you're going to take this and go mainstream with it and get it into retailers or are you kind of hoping like it kind of stays like sort of like indie band? Cause that's like the big thing with like guys, guys mm-hmm. get into bands and then it's like, I was into REM before they started doing, you know, big concert halls. It's like, yeah, whatever, but nobody gave a shit, you know? So, but then you're like, it's the same thing with watch companies. Like everybody wants to be into you when you have no business, you're not making any money. And as soon as you start building up a brand that's kind of successful and people start knowing about it, then it's like, oh, the guy's sold out. I'm not into him anymore. Do you right. fear that the same way guys, I guess, fear like going from garage band famous to like real life famous? I feel like the day I'm in the position where I can fear that, I've made it. Like that's right. awesome. Because right now I'm, I'm just trying to sell watches. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, like, Dude, I'm just I'm, trying to sell a watch. Please, God, buy a watch. Sell watches, bro. <laughs> but, but the thing is, of course, everyone has has the dream that you're going to turn this into a hugely successful business, and right. but, but yet maintain the cool indie vibe to it. Like that, I think that's everyone's dream to be the cool company that is also really big. And I, I don't know if that's possible, but you know, if if it is, great. If not. I, I reached the phase a long time ago where I was like, I enjoy this so much and I think it's so cool. Although it's heartbreaking and there is misery and there's, you know, I'm not all smiles all the time. I, I enjoy it enough that I told myself that like, I'm not doing this just because I have this vision that I'm going to be Rolex someday and I'll be riding around in my yacht. Right. I'm doing this because I'm passionate about it and ideally it can be, paying for itself and making me some money too. That's great to make this like a career. Um, but that I'm happy with that, but I do want to make it grow and see where it can go. So it's like, I, I'm too, it, it's too early for me to, to be, to, to know or even really properly answer that question. So you mentioned passion and I, we'll probably wrap up with this. So one of the things that I think is kind of sort of a buzzword that gets overused and has become a cliche is, you know, I'm so passionate. Like, to me, again, passion is sort of like table stakes. If you're going to make a business in this industry, 
you better be passionate. And why is because there really isn't a lot of money in it at first, mm -hmm. and not ever. So you better have, you better enjoy what you're doing. You better be driven by passion. But at the same time, passion alone won't get you there. And especially if you're never making money, you're not going to end up making money. There's not enough enjoyment in it. I don't care how passionate you are because there are many sleepless nights and, and you know, unending days and just so many frustrations with the prototyping and the production and the delays and dealing with, you know, everything. You have to be passionate. You have to make money. You have to be driven by something that gets you out of bed every day, even on the worst possible days. So, you know, what is it for you that gets you out of bed on the worst days when you have had two or three bad days in a row and it's been a lot of work and you're not yet feeling the rewards? Is it the future vision or is it just, I'm Jimmy Collins. I get, this is what I do. I get out of bed. My hair just looks like this and I'm happy all the time. Well, I think that the, the immediate answer to that is like the coffee. I need the coffee. That's that. That's the that's the thing that actually gets me out of bed. Is I kind of crawl out and I make coffee. 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 <laughs> yeah. So so, but I I would say that the other ingredient necessary to be a uh, a, a watch entrepreneur that's still doing this after a couple of years is insanity. So there's like a little bit of that, right? Yeah. Of just like I'm I, totally I, crazy. I think we're all a little touched. Yeah. There's no logical reason for me to be doing this, but here I am. And there's something there's something there that's driving me to do this. I think um, I, I think even just aside from passion, there's something enjoyable. Like I, I still am shipping all my own watches. I'm putting the straps on my watches. I'm kind of like very hands on with it. And I think that that going beyond just passion, there's a certain enjoyment for doing a physical thing for work. I think that so much of what work has become in this day and age is sitting in front of a computer typing. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just personally have like a need and a craving for like actual physical things, right? So I can like mm -hmm. actually hold a watch and put a strap on it and I can put it in a box and I can ship it off. And I think that there's something just, you know, satisfying about that. I think there's something nice about just having a project of like, all right, I'm going to strap up a hundred watches and just sit for hours doing that not checking your email, not right. sitting in front of a glowing rectangle and just doing something that's a little bit more like life used to be 50 years ago. Sitting in front of a glowing rectangle, that's going to be the title of my autobiography. Um, yeah. But going, so looking at the number of posts you have on the forums, <laughs> unless you have minions writing posts for you, you got to, I mean, you, I, I'm always impressed with you, Chris. Like I've emailed you a couple of times and I get a response like, a minute later and it's this big. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know the fit you. And there's like a couple of guys I know in, in my other business that, that do that. And I don't get how it's possible. I'm also a long email guy, but like I'll sit there for a while and type it out. But like, I'll get that response from you and it's like, boom. And I'm like, I don't know how you physically do that. It's all on the wrist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We are going to wrap up on this last question. So going back to, you know, when you're not staring at the glowing rectangle and you're sitting there doing something that quite honestly, I don't do that stuff anymore. Cause you know, I, I never put straps on the watches myself, but when I was doing like my own QC and my own order fulfillment, I kind of felt like, Hey, this is monotonous and boring. And I feel like I've got other more important things that I need to get to and I'm not getting to them. I need to be like more executive level and, you know, the tasks that I'm performing as the owner of the company. Um, but at the same time, I've never been a guy who in particularly enjoyed working with my hands. Um, and the only time I've ever really kind of felt like I was enjoying it was when I sort of tapped into almost like a Zen like sort of state where you do kind of disconnect your mind and you just get into a rhythm and you're just like, all right, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. And it's going to, you know, it all just kind of comes together for you. Are you a guy that likes to do things with your hands? Like you put together the studio or are you a guy that sort of appreciates the value in, you know, sort of a, 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 a ryth rhythmic activity that has sort of a Zen like, you know, trance that it puts you in. Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like I would love to be in the phase where I've got somebody else strapping all the watches, somebody else doing fulfillment. Like, and, and I hope to get there. Um, it's just, there's something nice where I'm at right now of being able to tune out 
and just do something like that. So I guess maybe somewhere in between, if that makes sense, where I, I find that I have to spend way too much time in front of the computer or on my phone and it drives me a little crazy after a while. So there's something nice about doing something that is productive. It is work because we're in this weird phase now in 2019 where it almost feels like unless you are in front of your computer typing something out, you are not being productive. And I hate That's exactly that. how I feel. I feel like if I'm not on my computer talking to people online, I'm not making money. Right. And anything and else that, I do, which is funny because it's like order fulfillment is important. Quality control is important. Everything I ever did served right. the, the end goal of getting the product into the customer's hand. So quality control, order fulfillment, all of that. I've got other people doing that right now. So I can focus on what I think is really my, my highest use of my time, which is talking to people online, talking to the customers, constantly, constantly, constantly being the face of the brand. It does get kind of exhausting though. And it, and it, it does kind of wear you down. And how do I go from that to like, oh, there's an email from Jimmy, boom, 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 this long, two minutes, you know? Right. Well, but also I will say that I think that's something that is really important and surprisingly productive. And, and I'm not a poster child for this. Like, it's not like I actually do this all the time. But I think going out and going for a run or going to the gym or doing something totally different, like, like you're going to go to the UK, that's a great thing. I think that sometimes with this American work ethic, entrepreneur kind of thing, we just feel we're like we need much. to be on 24-7 and if we're not, we're guilty. And I'm, and I'm guilty of that. Right. But I do find that when I do have to travel, you know, and I travel a lot for work for my other business, we're constantly, I just did a shoot in Costa Rica. And it's like, I would never justify taking myself to Costa Rica and in this phase right now for a vacation, but just being there completely set me in a different mindset oh, yeah. and, and gave me some great ideas. And I also got some great, great wrist shots too, you know, on the beach. When I go to Hong Kong to the Hong Kong show, yeah, I took a 24 hour flight and you know, um, sometimes there's Wi-Fi on the plane, but I typically won't use it. I'll watch movies or I'll read a book. And it's like 24 hours of uninterrupted, no business time. Awesome. And, and then we get there and it's like, okay, no wife, no kids, nobody, you know, none of the sort of daily whatever of my home life routine. I'm here in Hong Kong. I'm talking to people in the industry. I'm, a lot of these guys are my friends. We're going out drinking. That Hong Kong trip, I actually like live for that every couple of years because it is a lot of fun, but I come back and I'm always like super fired up and recharged. Like I feel like my batteries are at full strength, you know, yeah. after coming back from those trips. And um, you're yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, there, there was probably like a two year stretch, maybe even three years early on where I barely left my office. I would sleep maybe four hours a night. I, you know, and that like, I'm losing weight now. Like I put on like, a good 30 pounds. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't sleeping right. I stopped going to the gym and you know, like I was bark. I was like kind of angry all the time. Like I'm under a tremendous amount of stress. I'm arguing with my wife. I'm yelling at my kids and you're right. Like being able to distance yourself from the business, even if it's for an hour a day. Uh, but I got to tell you also part of it is just in my evolution as a business owner, getting past the point where I was doing everything myself, a big yeah. part of it is having people on the team to help out. Once I got people involved in design and quality control and outsourced my fulfillment, now it's like, okay, I don't have that feeling of I'm wasting time doing this monotonous task when I should be doing the more important stuff. Now I focus almost all of my work time on the most important stuff. And now it's like, I work eight hours a day, sometimes not even, sometimes a little bit more, depends on what's going on. But I feel like, at the end of that time, I was really effective. I got a lot done. It's very unusual now for me to feel like I just don't have enough hours in the day to do all the things I want to do. And I had to go through that kind of wasteland of two, three years of just nonstop activity where I did it all. And I felt like I, you know, like work expands to, to fill the time you give it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so guilty. That's me. Yeah. Like when we, and I think we all are in startup mode, but it, it gets better. But I think a big part of it is understanding that you don't have to be a one man show. You don't have to do everything yourself. And I can't wait to get to the quantities where I can justify that. So that's why, uh, you know, hopefully. I mean, I, I, I didn't have, it wasn't like I got to a point where I'm like, I'm doing so well, I can afford to hire other people. Uh, -uh. It was, I'm going to die if I don't hire other people wow. and, yeah. and I'll find the money 
I don't have the money, I'll find it. And I had to have a leap of faith where I was like, if I focus on all the things that really create the return on investment for my time and I outsource and off, you know, just kind of offload all that stuff that really doesn't, the money will be there. And it's worked out. And, and it, you know, it wasn't immediate. I had to kind of take a step back to take two steps forward, but I did take those two steps forward. And that's been this radical change in my life over the last year where it's just like so much better. I mean, I, I was telling people that Love it. a month ago, there was like a two day period where I literally had nothing to do. Design was handled, production <laughs> started. I had nothing in inventory. I was worried about moving. I was sold out of everything. Production has started. Designs are being handled. That's, I I'm jealous. I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. No fires to put out. It was wonderful. It was like a two-day vacation. That's amazing. See, the only way I can do that is to shut everything out <laughs> and and just go do something, you know, which I think is going to happen when I have to go to Italy for this wedding. But you'll, we'll you'll enjoy, other than the, the long flight and being in Italy for a wedding that, you know, you, you question how much of a friend this person really is, <laughs> you to get away and recharge your batteries. Just kind of put some distance between yourself and the business. I guarantee it. Yeah, I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. But. All right, so Kickstarter project will be done by the time this video airs, but the website for those watching is collinswatch.com. Under the accessories tab is where you can find the Collins eyewear. Hyperion, you haven't sold out yet, so you're still going to have some stuff in stock, and you still have the bronze, and you just got, or you're going to be getting more in soon. Yeah, we sold out of the meteorite variant and, and the carbon fiber variant, but we hopefully will sell out of the other two during the campaign but there's a good chance that we'll have a little bit of inventory left over. All right. So bright future ahead for Jimmy Collins. Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate you. Uh, you know, your constantly upbeat personality and uh, bring a little bit different tone to it. So, um, you know, all good things, my friend. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris.